Hi, my name's Keith Cooper, and in this video, I'm going to do a, a overview review of the Epson ET18100, also known as the L18050 in some regions. It's an EcoTank printer, so I've tested quite a few EcoTank printers, but this one is different in that it has six dye inks for it. Immediately that tells me that this is probably going to be a photo printer and not necessarily one that you'd use for art printing. But there's quite a few bits. I'll show some examples of this. Um, I'll cover what it's good for in the conclusions and some of the things that it's not so good for. Now, I'll say up front that the fact that it's not good for some things is not a problem because this is a printer that you would buy for a specific purpose. But anyway, let's have a look at the sort of the general sort of view of it. It's um, as with most printers these days, it's connected here. It's connected wirelessly. Very easy to set up. Just go to epson.sn, put the model number in and follow the instructions carefully. If you're using a Mac, Follow the instructions carefully because it is possible, although it does now, to install the driver so that you only get the air print version of the driver, which is good for nothing. So if you find lots of features missing in your driver when you've set it up on a Mac, it's probably because you've accidentally installed the air print driver. I've done it. Um, I've got videos looking at it and I've got some more info on the setup of this elsewhere. But as it stands, this is connected wirelessly. There is a USB uh, socket at the back here, works just fine. There is no ethernet on this printer. Also, if you've looked at other uh, EcoTank printers, in particular the 8550, the ET8550, which is a printer I really liked. Uh, quite a complex ink set, because that was a mixed ink set, so it had a dye black and a pigment black, and then some dye color inks. It worked very well, I was very pleased. It has a scanner on top. Biggest difference you're going to notice on this is there is no screen on the front. We are back to good old fashioned buttons and some lights behind them. Now, I've used this for a month or so, trying different prints and trying different things. And I still cannot remember what all these different things mean. There is a handy, convenient page in the manual uh, available online when you install things that tells you what all the various combinations of flashing lights and various things mean. Um, I cannot remember them. Um, most of them should never happen in normal use. So you don't really get any familiarity with them. And that's one of the things where the screen really helps. But you could say, I don't actually need the screen. All I want is a good printer. Well, in which case this is perhaps dealing towards what you've got here. Um, so there's the power button there. You can set it to go to power down after a certain while. Uh, it'll go into sleep mode. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an A3 plus. So that's 13 inch by 19 inch. So that size. So it's, you know, capable of making some nice big prints. Um, paper loads in the back here and away you go. Now, I mentioned the inks, the six dye inks. There is a black ink. There is a cyan, magenta and yellow ink. And then there is also a light cyan and a light magenta ink to give you six inks in all. Now that's the classic dye ink setup, which has been around for years, but not in this format, only in cartridge printers. I had one many years ago, an Epson 1290, uh, which is an A3 printer, and that had this same color set of inks. But of course, the real thing is that Lifting up the lid here, and uh, this picture here shows the ink compartment. Um, there we go, that's where the inks go in. You load up the inks from ink bottles. So they take 70 milliliter bottles, you fill them, you lift the tab here, you lift it, you put your ink in, and it fills up. It fills itself, the uh, bottles are keyed, so you can't put the wrong bottle in the wrong, uh, on the wrong tank. So you can't get it wrong like that. So that's really useful. Um, one thing though is the printer doesn't actually record ink levels at all. So you need to keep an eye on this at the front here. Now this, because of the size of the ink tanks, it will go down relatively slowly, but you do need to keep an eye on it because printers like this do not like running with no ink in them in a channel. It does not do the print heads any good at all. In fact, if you run them for any length of time with no ink in them, if you're lucky, the printer will spot it and warn you. If you're unlucky, bang goes your print head. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, so keep an eye on these levels here. Now, 
the inks themselves. There is a maintenance tank here which collects surplus ink from cleanings and the like. Um, I found very little clogging, no problems on this. This is a new printer, so I wouldn't expect it anyway. But the waste ink goes into this little tank here. There's a tab comes up here. You can swap the waste tank over. Um, the lack of electronic indication on the screen here makes me wonder how I'm going to know that the maintenance tank is full. Hopefully there will be some combination of lights flashing on here, which I'll then have to look up. Yeah, um, perhaps I do like having screens on these, although I must admit I do want a screen that I can actually read. Tiny little screens that you get on some printers are in many ways worse than useless. Um, you need good light on them and you need good eyesight or the right pair of glasses. Anyway, other aspects of this here, there is a replaceable roller at the back here, which is the paper take-up roller. Now, I imagine you would get an awful lot of prints out of that before you needed to do anything with it, but it is replaceable, which is a good sign. There is a little tab here, as on the other Ecotank printers, which pops over for shipping. You don't want to cart one of these printers about where there's any risk that the print head can move and the ink might siphon through the heads or you might just get an ink spillage or something. But anyway, there's a little, a little lever there that you use for locking when you're transporting and when you're using it, you flip it over like that. Uh, once again, if you start it up and it's got the lever in place, there is a pattern of lights will appear on the front here. I don't know what, well, I did see what happened, but I can't remember what happens. And there is, you know, perhaps the weakness of just relying on these. Now, you can drive the printer perfectly well from a phone, and there's quite a reasonable phone app for it. If you want to print photos from a phone, it's good for printing photos. Obviously, the best quality you're going to get is taking your photos into an editing application on a printer on a computer itself and actually do the printing from there. This printer is supported by the excellent and free Epson print layout software. Um, it works really well. I've got some examples. I've got quite a few other videos I've done looking at different aspects of printing with this, this printer here and it does work very well. Um, I was really quite pleased with the quality I got straight away from it. Um, I wouldn't normally you know, print from a phone other than to prove that you can do it. But yes, the phone can control this quite well. It's designed for that. Um, if you want to control your printer otherwise, you end up either going through the web printer's web page. Uh, there is the printer driver settings, the utility and things like that. So you can do a print head alignment, but you have to do it all through the computer. There's no sort of settings up here and doing stuff with the printer on its own. You need to actually have something connected to this to do a lot of things with it. So here's the, uh, the web page for it. It gives you not a great deal of information, it tells you how many prints you've had, allows you to update the firmware and a few things like that. Um, if you do see updated firmware for a printer like this, um, I always install it when I see it. Um, cameras, I would normally recommend delaying a few weeks before installing new firmware, but printers in general, um, I've never come across a problem where updating firmware has caused any issues. So that's, that's running here from this Mac. Uh, that's a different Mac that's running Ventura, the latest Mac OS 13. Uh, that works fine with it. I haven't tested it on, on PCs at all, but I see no reason why it should be any way different. But if you want to print, and the easiest way of getting into printing well with this from a computer, get the Epson print layout software. You can run it, uh, call it directly from in Photoshop, or you can just drop pictures on top of it. Um, it is an easy way of finding out what the printer can do without having to worry too much about print settings and things. Yes, you need to, your workflow may be a little bit more involved, but it works and it has template capacity and things like that. It can print borderless. The printer manages borderless, no problem whatsoever. I do notice in the manual though that there is a there is a, an overspray uh, catching uh, pad in this underneath where the print head goes and that catches borderless overspray. At a certain point, if you print borderless a lot, it will tell you that the borderless pad is filled up and that you need to switch over and consider and, and get it serviced. And this is not a user serviceable part. Now, I don't know how many borderless before, someone will ask, but I don't know how many borderless prints you could expect to get from this before that happens. Quite a lot, I suspect, but 
it is something that will happen. And say so it's because to print borderless, as the print goes through, um, the printer has to print over the edge of the paper and that ink has to go somewhere. And that is another thing that if you print a lot of borderless, and this is a relatively, you know, it's not fast printer, it's not a slow printer. It takes a minute or two, depending on quality settings, to do a good quality print. High quality, I found, definitely worth using if you're not in a hurry. Um, it prints, but you will collect ink inside here from the overspray from things if you print borderless. So be prepared to clean inside here occasionally. Um, keep your printer clean and that will stop you getting inky smudges on paper, make it much less likely. But for setting up, there is only one print slot with this. There's no sort of rear print slot or anything like that. This is where I have to remember this, that you lift it up and tilt it back. And there's where the sheet goes in. Now, this takes quite a depth of papers. And I noticed when stacking photo papers, I stacked a dozen sheets of photo paper in it and it went no problem whatsoever. The paper feed for multiple sheets, plain paper as well. You could put a big stack of plain paper. Now, plain paper, there are no real office functions with this. Um, you haven't got the sort of stuff you get in a general purpose printer like the 8550 uh, with the scanner and, and things like that. So this is just a straightforward printer. There is no duplex. You, if you want double sided, you have to put the sheet of paper back in and print on the other side of it. Um, it doesn't support double sided, but it takes quite a lot of sheets of paper. Incidentally, if you wanted to print panoramic, you can feed a long custom sheet of paper in, feed it over the top and let it come through. Now, um, I haven't got any tests of panoramic at the moment. Um, I tried one briefly, it seemed to work okay, but I haven't got any detailed prints to show you on that one. But I will we'll look at that before this goes back. But it's shown in the manual as how to do panoramic prints, which would suggest that it's gonna work okay subject to the usual paper criteria. And pa pa what paper you choose is important. And I'm gonna come back to that when I look at profiling and all the other aspects of things like that. But setting the printer up, it works. Um, printer output, there is no motorized output tray. So you do need to pull the tray out. So if you forget to pull the tray out, there will be some flashing lights of some sort. And hopefully you'll remember to pull the tray out. But that's where your prints come out there. There is also underneath that, there is stored a tray for printing DVDs, CDs and ID cards. Now, I tried the ID cards. I've oh, got some ID cards. Um, the ID cards just fit in the little slot, the plastic ones like that. Let the ink dry. They will last fine. These are not going to be good for everyday use for people handling them. They're not that robust, they're not laminated or anything. But if you're looking at ID cards, which are just needed for an event for a few days or something like that, these are actually quite nice. The Epson Photo Plus software, have a look at it. It covers all of that. And I've got, I've got a video specifically looking at printing these. And that is my Northlight Images official photographer card that I created as a, to, uh, well, hopefully next time I get stopped by security people who haven't been told that I'm working on a job somewhere, that I can sort of flash this at them and who knows, um, maybe yeah, I am not the photographer you're looking for. But that is the card that you can print two at the same time. You can print both sides, but wait for them to dry because the inks do take a while to dry. Now, if we just pop that back in there, it won't go. You have to get the right slot and in it goes there and we've got that. So there we go. That's business cards, uh, ID cards printed. What about prints, profiling and all of that? Well, as part of any testing for printers, I do a lot of paper testing, look at different papers. I make profiles. Um, I do test images and here are some test images of the ones and I've got I, I put links to where you can download some of these some of these test images and this was a very early print I did this is just on Epson premium glossy photo paper it's even got Epson stamped on the back of it um, it's great 
it works really well. You do get some Epson color profiles installed for this, some, uh, for some papers, but I've made lots of my own and I will be putting a list in due course of all the profiles I've made, which are available on request free for non-commercial use. But how does this work with different papers? Well, they all go in the back here. There's no worry about that. And I made a lot of profiles. Now, that's a profiling sheet that I use for on an A3 Plus sheet. There's nearly 3,000 patches there, which means the profiles are actually rather good. And, you know, they work very well if the paper is compatible with the printer. So I've got lots of different media here that I tried. Here's a, an art paper. Now, the A4 sheet that I tried here, this worked quite well. I tried a few other art papers and I noticed that when I came to actually testing the, what the papers looked like and scanning them, there were some fine dent type grooves from it. Now, I've seen no pizza wheel effect or the, uh, which is a common complaint sometimes for printers like this, nothing whatsoever. The dye inks themselves, they settle into the paper nicely. So there's no gloss differential here. I can't see the ink sitting on the paper. This particular one here is a Photospeed metallic luster. And if you like metallic papers, this printer works a treat. Now, the gamut of this is not as big as you would get with the big Epson P5000 here, which is a pigment ink printer. But if you take a very glossy print, you print it on the, on the Epson, yeah, you can get a bigger gamut. But if you look at it with light just shining off it like this, you will see that you've got ink sitting on the paper. It doesn't soak in the same way as dyes do. And there's a big difference between dye inks and pigment inks. On RC or resin coated photo papers, the dyes of this work really well. Um, I've got no pro every paper I tried, photo paper I tried, worked really well. Where I had issues was when I tried printing on thicker papers, art papers. Now, I noticed that some art papers, and this is, you can see between the two of them, that the colours are, hopefully this shows on the video, that the colours are much less intense on this matte paper. Well, does that mean that they don't work? on this. Well, there's only one matte paper setting, which is you look at the media settings available in the driver and that suggests to you that matte paper is not a big thing for this printer and it isn't. Um, I found some papers worked very well. Now this is actually an artist matte, HP artist matte canvas. This is about 380 gram. Um, I've printed on a canvas. It works okay. I tried some Baraita papers dents on them. Paper print, you know, the actual images looked fine, but when it came to marks on the paper, I don't really want dents on it. So there's another matte paper and there is another matte paper. Now this one instantly, the paper, the ink, the colors look stronger. This is um, Hannah Muller watercolor paper, 210 gram works very well. As I say, all of these profiles that will be available, but it's a thin paper. Uh, here is a Red River paper. This one is a canvas paper. So it has a canvas type pe texture. It's a paper. It also works very well. But you try some art papers, they don't work so well or they mark. So in that respect, this is one for photo papers. I've noticed and I've heard from talking to people that the amount of marking you get varies by printer. Um, so it seems to be tolerances related things. Some, paper, some printers mark papers more thick papers than others. This one does show the marks. Other printers I've had didn't show any marks, whereas other people did get marks. So always check if you're using, and I would say non-standard papers, because remember in the driver settings for this, there are no uh, settings for fine art paper. You take that as a hint. If there are no settings for something, it's possible that the printer's not meant for it. Now, you can set this to thick paper um, in the settings and the driver here, you can adjust various bits. You can set that, but it doesn't seem to make much difference other than the head is less likely to cause any smears or catch the edges of the paper. 
If you're trying thicker papers, make sure they're properly flat papers because if there's any curl at the edges, the head will touch and you'll get marks on the edge of the paper. So I've got piles and piles of these test prints here. And these actually tell you as much as the test images themselves about how paper is going to perform. And it means that you should get the right media settings. As I said, there is only one matte media setting. Um, I printed on Epson Premium Luster, for example, standard Epson paper I've used for years, and there isn't a Premium Luster setting. So there's just the Premium Semi Gloss. Now there is Ultra Premium, etc., etc. Lots of different versions of glossy papers. Once again, look at that list of papers that there are and you'll see that um, that's the hint is what you're going to use it. If you look at the paper list, there are loads of supported paper sizes, but there is a limit on some paper sizes are not supported borderless. So you can't, no printer I've ever tested does borderless on custom paper sizes. So be careful if it borderless is important to you to check the specifications to see that the paper you want to size you want to use will actually print borderless. I say A3, that is a borderless print. That one looks great. That's uh, um, on Permajet's titanium gloss 300, a metallic uh, paper that Really, the images off this just lift off. It, it looks excellent. Um, I'm hoping that it shows some of the feel for the print shows in the image there when I just move that. But that's a really nice one. Black and white. Now, I have a black and white section of the test image here, but I have got a specific black and white test image that I use for checking linearization and things. Now, I saw somebody, uh, I produced a review of this printer, and they said, the black and white prints don't look too bad. Well, given in the video, as I saw it, I could see a color tint in the black and white tints. I'm going to say I disagree. Uh, this, unfortunately, is not a printer for black and white. Now, it doesn't mean you can't use black and white. There is a grayscale option in the driver to print, but there is no specific black and white print mode, such as you get in other paper, uh, other printers. Uh, this certainly uh, P5000, 8550 has it. Um, if you don't have a black and white print mode, it suggests, once again, like the settings, that the printer was never meant for black and white. Now, under this light, and these are different settings here, I'm not sure which ones on the video will actually show as having a color tint, but I can see a color tint to these. Um, I've got one here that was printed. This was using um, a profile that I'd made, custom profile. It looks okay in the sunlight. You take these prints to a room with warm lighting in, they look different. Bit of daylight, they look different again. The problem is with any dye ink printer, and this goes for every time I've tested a dye ink printer, the black and white is unpredictable. It doesn't matter how much you try and produce profiles for it, you change the viewing lighting and the paper and you'll, you'll see a, a color tint. And the problem is with black and white like this, if like myself, you've been doing black and white for years, your criteria for what you deem acceptable may be a bit higher and that you don't like having slight color tints to things. Now, I could produce great looking black and white prints on this pigment ink printer, but it's huge and it's much more expensive. That's one of the things for black and white, what you need to do. But the 8550, for example, uh, ET 8550, um, much better for this. Supports a wider range of papers as well. But I've, I've got lots of information on that. Um, but this, the problem is, once I see a color tint in a black and white print like this, I can't unsee it. Now, if you are lucky enough not to notice the color tints, then that's great. But somebody comes along and goes, why is your print green? because they've maybe got slightly better eyesight, better color vision than you. Um, yeah, that's not going to I certainly wouldn't want to show anything black and white produced on this in a competition. Um, certainly if I, I was asked to look at some prints and, and they were meant to be black and white and they were purplish tinge or greenish tinge, no, no. Um, should have printed on a better system than this. But anyway, that's black and white. So, COVID. ID cards, printing on papers, all the different sort of stuff out like this. Anything this won't print on, as I said, thicker papers, brighter papers, uh, they tend to be relatively easy to mark. Some of them looked okay, but they had 
dents on them, so I couldn't... Yeah, they're, they're not prints that I would want to show. Um, yeah, it's a great print. Oh, don't mind those two slight uh, like roller marks on it. Um, no, it doesn't work. Not a single mark on the glossy ones, though. So, you know, glossy, it works for. So, some conclusions on this particular printer. What's it, what's it good for? Colour photo prints. If I want to run off a load of glossy, luster, very glossy, colour photo prints, this is excellent. I could stack up a load of photo paper in here and just run them off and let them pile up on the desk in front of it. Um, no problem whatsoever. It's in many ways for glossy, impactful colour images, this printer is better than the P5000 here. Now, if I'm printing on brighter papers or other stuff and I'm making big prints, then I'm just still going to pick this one. But if I want pictures I can just show to people and they look good, just for handling, whatever. If I want quick pictures, this printer works really well. Um, and that's it. RC style photo papers, printing colour prints. Yep, best printer I've ever tested for this. Um, when you factor in the fact that it's an ink tank printer. There is an ink, uh, a, you know, a dye based printer I've printed which does produce better than this, but it's much bigger than this and it doesn't have ink tanks. So if ink tanks are important to you and that's cost of printing, then currently this one takes the record for that. It's the best I've tried. So what not to like about it? Well, I mentioned black and white. Um, art papers, if you wanted to print cards through this, they may go through it okay, they may not go through it okay, um, they may feed okay. I put several sheets of art paper in this and it fed perfectly okay, but somewhere in the mechanism here something marked them and they were not really that good. Uh, smaller cards would be okay because the roller marks are at a distance apart on the sheet. So if your paper, if you're printing quite small cards, this one probably works well for that as well. So, but it's a little bit unpredictable um, and that's the issue I have with it there. So you know, to, to round it off, it is good for colour prints. I'm, I appreciate screens on printers all the more, having to go back to one which just has buttons and lights and you know flashing lights and little symbols and stuff. I don't know what these mean. Um, I shouldn't have to know what they mean. Um, I shouldn't have to stop and look them up every, if something happens. Now, it doesn't happen often, but for example, if you're printing ID cards, you print first, the data is sent to the printer, you then put the card holder in. You don't load the cold card holder first. In fact, you wait, you print, and you wait for some lights to change here and something like that, and then you push it in and away it goes. It's all very easy. So it's a printer that's great for colour photos. What's not to like if that's what you want to do? Um, so this particular printer, at the moment, I don't think Epson are selling in the US, which seems rather strange given how good a printer it is. It's also known as the L18050 in some markets, different numbering system, but EcoTank die base printer, yep, it's great. Um, minus a few foibles and things. Anyway, I hope that's been of interest. Um, please do subscribe to the channel if you, if you find it interesting, because um, I've got more specific videos about this and I'll have the detailed written review as well at some point. Um, unfortunately paying work has got in the way of um, actually writing the stuff. It takes quite a lot longer to write the big long written reviews than it does to make these videos. But if you've got any questions please just ask because it's people asking questions that gives me ideas for new uh, videos. Short videos just answering people's queries. Topics, if there's anything particular you want to know about papers, whatever, and things like that, please just ask away. Hope that's been of interest and thanks for watching.